Welcome all. Today we are going to talk about cunningly devised fables. But before we do, let's just open with a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we invite you to be amongst us. May your Holy Spirit guide us. May your angels protect us. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to talk about cunningly devised fables. Now this, of course, comes from a Bible verse, 2 Peter 1.16, where it states, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So that which they believed, they believed was founded upon a very firm foundation. It's interesting that they were speaking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ then, and of course their great hope was the return of Jesus Christ. And what they believed was based upon the word of God. It was not a fable. It was a fact in their mind. In other words, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, when the Reformation rediscovered great truths in the Bible, eventually Martin Luther was led to the thought that the church had been held in captivity. And he wrote in 1520 on the Babylonian captivity of the church. So according to Luther, the Pope was holding the church in captivity through the use of the sacramental system and Rome's theology. In other words, the church had developed a creed, but the creed was far removed from what the Bible actually taught. And sooner or later, the creed and the scriptures would come into conflict. Now initially... In 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the church door at Wittenberg, the issue was not the scriptural differences at all. The issue was pure and plainly just regarding indulgences. But truth is progressive. And as the reformers studied and they saw the conflict between scripture and creed, the thought developed that the Bible was the basis for all knowledge and for all truth. And so the watchword of the Reformation became sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Truth is progressive, and it took a while to unearth the treasures in the Bible. And many were discovered long after the reformers had actually done their work and gone to rest, truth is constantly unfolding as we dig deep in the word of God. Now, one of Martin Luther's friends and colleagues was a man by the name of Andreas Bodenstein. And he hailed from a town called Karlstadt. And so they called him Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt. And later on, he just became... Karlstadt. Just one of those things. Now Martin Luther was for a while exiled in the Wartburg. And while he was there, he actually translated the Bible into the German tongue. But Karlstadt and the other colleagues like Melanchthon, etc., carried on the work of reform. And Karlstadt was actually ahead of Martin Luther when it came to unraveling some of the biblical truths in the Bible. What's very interesting is that Martin Luther and Karlstadt were contemporaries, and they were the same age. Karlstadt was just a few months older than he was, and Karlstadt was in fact the dean of theology at the University of Wittenberg. So in a sense, he was Martin Luther's boss. Now, while Martin Luther was in exile, Karlstadt introduced reforms as he discovered them in the Bible. And some of the things that he discovered were actually ahead of where the Reformation was. The first great truth that the Reformation unearthed out of the Scriptures was, of course, justification by faith. But Karlstadt also realized that there was another dimension 
namely sanctification and not just justification. So Karlstadt placed a great emphasis on the law of God and sanctification. And this brought a little bit of uneasiness. Another thing that he did is he removed the statues out of the churches and the images. And when Martin Luther actually came out of exile, he was actually perturbed because this movement was too fast and he actually reversed some of the reforms that Karlstadt had introduced. Also, the idea that sanctification and the law were so important led some to believe that this was leading towards legalism. Another issue was that Karlstadt actually recognized the Sabbath in the Bible. He didn't distinguish between Sunday and Saturday at that stage, but he placed such emphasis upon it that Martin Luther was compelled to write, if Karlstadt were to write further about the Sabbath, Sunday would have to give way and the Sabbath, that is Saturday, must be kept holy. Eventually, the conflict became so great that they actually separated. Later in life, Karlstadt and Luther were reconciled. But many of these truths never really became ensconced in the Protestants of that time. As more truths were discovered, greater problems arose. Now, one of the truths that really shook early Protestantism was the discovery of the baptism by immersion, adult baptism by immersion. And this discovery was discovered by a group known as Anabaptists. And the man responsible largely for this theology in the beginning was a man by the name of Balthasar Hubmeier of Waldhut. Again, the town from which he hailed, Waldhut, his name was Balthasar Hubmeier. His German names are, are rather quaint and they sort of roll off the tongue. Now, why was this such an important discovery? Firstly, I have to ask, do we find adult baptism in the Bible? And the answer is yes. So those that discovered this truth were enthusiastic about it. And they wanted everybody to accept it. But they met with tremendous resistance. Why? What is the reason why the simple issue of adult baptism should create such a furor? Well, let's, let's break it down. The early church was a church of free believers, but eventually, in the time of Constantine, it became a church, state, conglomerate. And the two were united from that time onwards, and the Roman Catholic system was strongly encased in a system of a union of church and state. And the church used the state to enforce its doctrines and its decrees. And when Protestantism came out of the Roman Catholic Babylonian captivity, then it also, of course, embraced the church-state concept. And as such, if you were born, you were automatically a citizen of the state, but you also became a member of of the church. So in Protestant areas, the state and the Protestant church were united, and in Catholic areas, the state and the Catholic church were united. And this was the mode of thinking. Now imagine if you only became a member of the church if you had discovered truths in the Bible and you made a cognitive decision that you were going to follow the Bible, what if there were issues that came into conflict with the state? So the problem arose that a free church of free believers could not be subject to the state, was the reasoning of Balthasar Hupmeier of Waldhut. And this created 
major problems. So the Anabaptists came into conflict with the church-state system. So it wasn't only this, but this civil government issue created the great problem because it was going to split the Christian society. So some of these radicals, as they were called, wanted a totally self-governing church free of government interference. Now originally, in Switzerland, Swingley was quite keen on the idea, but then he realized the impl implications, and uh, he divorced himself from that idea. And it became such a problem that eventually the state and the church revolted against the Anabaptist movement, and they were condemned to death. Some were even condemned to death if they just listened to an Anabaptist preacher. And because they were people that stood for rebaptism, because they'd all been baptized as infants into the system, they were called Anabaptists, and the punishment largely was drowning. You want to be rebaptized? We'll rebaptize you. So they held them under the water until they died, and thousands upon thousands died for their faith. Now, was the faith that they had regarding adult baptism incorrect? The answer is no. It is a biblical concept. But the issue of church and state became the problem. Now, there were other factors that were introduced. And another factor was introduced by a man by the name of Hans Hoot. Now, Hans Hoot was an Anabaptist, so he believed in adult baptism. He believed everything that the Reformers had discovered. Sola Christos, saved by Christ and Christ alone. Sola Scriptura. But in his Bible study, besides adult baptism, he discovered another concept. And that was the biblical concept of premillennialism. Now, this is a major problem because the Catholic Church didn't believe in premillennialism. In other words, they didn't believe that Christ would return to this earth prior to the millennium. In fact, Roman Catholicism didn't believe in the millennium at all. They believed in amillennialism. In other words, the church, together with the state, would rule until the entire earth and world was subject to its teachings. And the Protestants, the conservative Protestant world, had adopted this idea and also believed in, in amillennialism. There was no such thing as a thousand-year period. This was rather applied to the church when the church would rule over all the nations. So the issue of church and state, again, is a, is a major issue here. And premillennialism was not welcomed. In actual fact, Hans Hut held a meeting in the town of Augsburg in 1527. Now this is just 10 years after Martin Luther had nailed the thesis to the church door. And they arrested them all all these Anabaptists, including Hans Hut, and they tortured him horribly. And that night, a fire resulted in his prison, and he was asphyxiated. He died in the Augsburg prison on the 6th of December, 1527. The next day, the authorities sentenced his dead body to death and burnt him. Now, this is amazing. Such anger at the discovery of a biblical truth. Now, these people that we have spoken about were willing to die for these truths. They had not discovered cunningly devised fables. They had discovered a biblical truth. But the world was not prepared to accept it because it came into collision with their creeds. The Sabbath issue also would not go to rest. And there was another Anabaptist by the name of Oswald Gleit. And he discovered the Sabbath in greater detail. Karlstadt had already referred to it. 
The Anabaptists had discovered adult baptism, and now Oswald Glate wrote about the Sabbath. And he penned a little booklet which was called Vom Sabbat, which means from the Sabbath, about the Sabbath. Well, did this go down well? The answer is no. He was arrested and imprisoned in Vienna in 1545 and then taken out at night and drowned in the autumn of 1546. Did he follow a cunningly devised fable when he wrote about the Sabbath issue or is it a biblical concept? The answer is it is a biblical concept. But it disturbed the norm and the creed of the churches. And this is the important point. When truth, when biblical truth comes into conflict with creeds and with alliances of church and state, then you can expect persecution. Now, the Anabaptists split into many, many groups according to their teachers. One of the groups was the Mennonites, and the Mennonites were taught by a man called Menno Simon. Now, we don't have to go into all the details, but one of the things that they really stood for, besides the fact that adult baptism was recognized, one of the things they stood for was pacifism. In other words, the church was not to be involved in uh, military activities for governments. So pacifism became a problem for the state. In fact, many of the early Protestants came into conflict not only with the church or with the system or with the state, but uh, in many other respects as well. And many paid for their beliefs with their lives. John Frith discovered biblical truths, not cunningly divine fables. He discovered that purgatory was nowhere to be found in the Bible because purgatory is a system where you yourself pay for your transgressions. And that, of course, takes the emphasis away of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then he also was opposed to transubstantiation. Biblical truths. And he paid for it with his life. Other biblical truths discovered by these early reformers were just as uh, unwelcome in the world. For example, the doctrine of soul sleep was firmly believed by Luther, by Tyndall, and by John Frith. And it made deep inroads into British thinking. And John Milton was a firm believer in this doctrine, and he was the author of Paradise Lost. So here were treasures, not cunningly devised fables, that were unearthed by these reformers. And then you have another movement, which is the Baptist movement. Now, John Smythe is believed to have the first church labeled Baptists in Amsterdam in 1609. Now, they also believed in adult baptism, but apparently independent of the Anabaptists. Be that as it may, the Baptists had this common uniting factor, adult baptism, but there were many other issues where they were divided on some of these things. Some of the great Baptists that we still remember to this day are John Bunyan, for example, who wrote this beautiful work, Pilgrim's Progress. I mean, you think about these books, and you think, what a deep religiosity these people must have had. What a deep insight into Scripture. What a faith system. This is one of the classics that everyone should read. And these were not cunningly devised fables. They believed in biblical truths. Did they have it all together? Not necessarily. Another group that was very much persecuted was the Congregationalists. Now they, again, believed that the church is independent of the state. And the founders of that movement in England were Barrow and Greenwood. And they, of course, were martyred as a consequence. So this seems to be a trend 
in the history of humanity. Now, when it comes to the Baptists, there are different groups within the Baptists' confession, and particularly two groups, General Baptists and Particular Baptists. Now, we don't have to go into all the detail. If somebody wants to look at the detail, they can read it on the slide. But General Baptists basically believe that Everybody qualified for the grace of Christ. And particular Baptists were more Calvinistically inclined and believed that salvation was only for the elect. And this conflict raged not only through the whole of Protestantism, but within this one particular group as well. Now, one of the greatest preachers in the Baptist movement was, of course, Charles Spurgeon. And what was he? Was he inclined towards Calvinism? In other words, believing that only the elect will be saved? Or was he more of a general Baptist? No, he himself claimed that he was a Calvinist. And he said that these truths were ensconced in the word of God. So all of these conflicts existed in the early church and they still exist to this very day. How do you reconcile all of these things? Another group within the Baptist church was the Seventh-day Baptist movement. So they believed in the Sabbath. And they belong to the Baptists and is separated later on the basis of the Sabbath truth. Now, the Millerite movement that eventually gave rise to the Advent movement was influenced by Rachel Oakes, who was a Seventh-day Baptist, because she introduced the Sabbath truth to this group. So there was this early influence. So as these truths were being discovered, and researched in the Bible, people came to believe them and to realize that they were not cunningly devised fables. Another church that developed was, of course, the Methodist Church that was founded by John Wesley. Now, John Wesley had no intention of separating from the Church of England. In fact, he was an ordained minister within that grouping. But he discovered again what Karlstadt had already discovered, namely sanctification. You cannot get rid of the law of God. The law of God is binding, and obedience is a prerequisite, and you have to apply this faith. It has to become a method in your life. And so they started mocking them as Methodists. Also, they discovered that temperance, even in what you eat and what you drink, is part of the biblical teaching. Now, you can imagine that that didn't go down very well in those times. And these preachers were hounded. They drove herds of cattle through their meetings. They dragged them by their hair to the magistrates. And eventually there was no way to reform the entire church, so Methodism became a movement by itself. So much suffering, so much pain. And why? Because people had discovered truths which they realized were not cunningly devised fables. If we go to the book of Hebrews, then Paul lists all the great heroes of the Bible whether he's talking about Gideon or Samson or Jephthah, and all of these issues and the great things that they did, and how through faith the women received their dead raised to life again, and how others had trials of cruel mocking and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. 
And if you think of these Protestant movements that were hounded, the Anabaptists that were murdered in their thousands, how they went to the far reaches to try and escape the persecution. And why? Because they had discovered truths that were not based on cunningly devised fables. Now the Bible tells us that there will be very troublous times here just before the coming of Christ. If we go to the book of Revelation chapter 13, it tells us about another beast coming up out of the earth that had two horns like a lamb, but spoke as a dragon. And it tells us that he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And then it continues to tell us that this power will eventually issue a death decree against those that do not honor the decrees of this system and of the first beast. Now the Bible is very clear in its description of the first beast. And the reformers were all of one mind that this system, the first beast, referred to Roman Catholicism. The second beast is like unto the first. And it will deceive them that dwell upon the earth by means of miracles which it had power to do in the sight of the beast. So there must be some religious connotation associated with the second political power that will greatly honor the first power, the beast, which was church and state, the Roman system of the Middle Ages, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and lived. So the first beast, Roman Catholicism, suffered a deadly wound. It lost its political power in 1798, but the wound would be healed. It would get its political power back. And we know that Rome today plays an incredibly important political role. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. In other words, persecution would raise its ugly head again. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 and 10, we read about an angel that will say with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In other words, the Bible warns that if you accept the principles of the beast and the image of the beast, you come into conflict with God. That's being between a rock and a hard place. How do you stand regarding this issue? This battle has been raging for centuries. In Europe, as we saw, as biblical truths were uncovered, the blood flowed. Why? Because it came into conflict with the creeds. Now, when the second beast rose out of the earth, in other words, out of the unpopulated areas of the world, there was a decision made that this bloodshed and conflict that existed in Europe on the basis of religious dissension should not be tolerated. And James Madison is known as the father of the Constitution. He died in 1836, and he wrote, The purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. Is it possible that this power that went so far as to separate church and state, would speak again like a dragon? Now the Bible tells us that the dragon gave its power unto the first beast, and the dragon is Satan, 
And Satan is one who coerces and forces, whereas God draws and convicts through his Holy Spirit. And you have the freedom of choice to reject it or to receive it. When the Anabaptists discovered adult baptism, they were prepared to die for it. When all of these other truths were discovered, they were prepared to die for it. And here again, it seems that a similar conflict will arise. If you go to the history sources of America, it will tell you that the great majority left Europe to worship God in the way that they believe to be correct. And this is a government webpage. Is it possible that this second beast would again speak as a dragon? By the middle of the 18th century, the New World had received representatives not only of the major Reformation churches, Lutheran, Reformed and Anglican, but had also been seeded with all the rediscovered truths brought by the evangelicals seeking freedom of worship that had been denied them in Britain and the continent. So writes Emerson in the Reformation and the Advent Movement. Now, Here's an interesting point. All of these great truths for which people had laid down their lives, were they buried and forgotten? No. The largest churches in the United States today are not the original Lutheran or Reformed Anglican churches, but in fact the Baptist church and the Methodist church became the largest churches. And uh, they had truths which the others had basically declined to follow. But other truths that lay scattered were also gathered after the Millerite movement. And the Advent movement embraced the truths that Hans Hut was willing to die for, that Glatt was willing to die for, that all the others, Frith and uh, Tyndall, were prepared to die for. And is it possible that these truths based on biblical principles would once again come into conflict with the state? So the final gathering must embrace the great truths because once it is truth, thy word is truth, it cannot be negated. They must again be incorporated in a final body of truth. That means sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola fide, by faith alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola Christos, by Christ alone. Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. These great Protestant truths must be part of a final movement of truth as well. But there must be additional truths that people had discovered that they were prepared to die for a re-emphasis on sanctification and the significance of the Ten Commandments as the standard of righteousness. Karlstadt had already embraced it. The Methodists made it prominent later on in history. The significance of the Sabbath. Part of the Baptist movement had discovered the significance of the Sabbath and formed the Seventh-day Baptist group, out of which... Finally, the Advent movement accepted this biblical truth as well. Then the church as a free community separated from the state. The Congregationalists were prepared to die for it. Anabaptists had died for it. Believers' baptism, the same applies there. Evangelical supper preceded by foot washing. That is something that is very biblical. In fact, it is a command in the Bible. Do this in remembrance of me, refusal to take up the sword at the command of the state. The Mennonites had already done that. Belief in the sleep of the dead and the physical resurrection. Martin Luther believed it. Frith believed it. Tyndall believed it. And many of the early reformers believed it. Resurgent interest in Bible prophecy, the Millerite movement, rediscovery of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Expectation of the premillennial second advent of Christ. Hans Hut had already espoused it in the time of Martin Luther. 
And all of these truths lay scattered in the various sects of Protestantism. But God saw fit to bring it into one movement. John 16 verse 13 says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. There we have the idea of prophecy and all truth. Did all the churches embrace all the truth, or did they stay stuck where the reformers had remained stuck. In Psalms 25, verse 5, we read, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. In thee do I wait all the day. Lead me in thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 7, verse 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And as the Methodists already said, it's no good just to believe. You must also do. 2 Timothy 3 verse 8. And as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do those also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Whenever there is truth, there will be resistance to truth. Is it possible... That in our modern world, creeds will become so important that humanity will unite on creeds and again persecute those that have discovered truths that are not based on cunningly devised fables. The Pope just met a huge representation of church and state officials in Kazakhstan between 13 and 15 September. And he stated emphatically that the creeds were not to be attacked by those which he labeled fundamentalists. And he made it quite clear that he wasn't only referring to terrorist activities and violence. He was talking about fundamentalists in all creeds and denominations. They were the scourge of humanity and should be eradicated. When you look up that word fundamentalists in the dictionaries of the world, it will tell you that in the Christian sense, it is people that believe the word of God as it stands. Is it possible that the same conflict will raise its head again? Doesn't the Constitution prevent this from happening? Well, here's an article from the 1st of August, 2022. Trump tied conservatives are 15 states away from an unprecedented rewrite of the Constitution. Hmm. Why would they want to rewrite the Constitution? It says here the Convention of the State Movement is just one of the organizations pushing for such a convention. But it's perhaps the best funded and has made the most recent progress. Five states, Wisconsin, South Carolina, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and West Virginia have passed the organization's pro-convention resolution in the past two years. So they are trying to amend the Constitution. Of course, they will give good reasons, but is there something happening behind the scenes? We have to look at the movers and shakers and find out why they want to change the Constitution. Well, Rick Santorum, who was a presidential candidate in 2012, he wants the states to throw a live piece of ammo at Washington with constitutional convention. He wants the Republican state lawmakers to throw a grenade at Washington and pull the pin with the first of its kind constitutional convention. Why does he want to pull this pen? You've got a live piece of ammo in your hands, he said. 34 states, if every Republican legislature votes for this, we have a constitutional convention. It would rein in the deep state and assured the assembled lawmakers that the GOP's interests would dominate a one-state, one-vote 
for the same reason that rural conservative areas have an outsized influence in the Electoral College and the Pennsylvania legislature. All right, it would reign in the deep state. So the front is, let's reduce the size of government. Let's get back to the originals. But is there another philosophy? Well, let's have a look what MSNBC has to say on the issue. One of the strangest things about January the 6th for a lot of Americans was how many people in the pro-Trump crowd advertised their religious faith. Flags that read, Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president. Some people literally carried crosses to the Capitol and led prayer groups on that day. The religious right has been around for a long time, but this kind of political expression of religion, one not separate from but intimately connected to government, has grown increasingly common lately. We need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. As long as we are confident and united, the tyrants we are fighting do not stand a chance. Because we are Americans, and Americans kneel to God and God alone. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. But what exactly is Christian nationalism? According to Christianity Today, it is a mass movement that believes the American nation is defined by being Christian and the government should keep it that way. Some of these faithful are even building patriot churches where parishioners pray that, quote, communism and socialism and transgenderism and homosexuality and abortion will not have their way in this land. And they're getting elevated in Republican politics like Doug Mastriano the GOP nominee for Pennsylvania governor. Now, Mastriano is taking heat for his close relationship with Andrew Torba, the CEO of the right-wing social media site Gab, who this week renewed his calls for an exclusively Christian nationalist conservative movement. So, no, we don't want people who are atheists. We don't want people who are Jewish. This is an explicitly Christian movement because this is an explicitly Christian country. Now, we're not saying that, uh, you know, we're going to deport all these people or whatever. You're free to stay here, right? You're not going to be forced to convert or anything like this, but you're going to enjoy the fruits of living in a Christian society under Christian laws. In other words, what they want is a union of church and state where you will live under Christian laws. Now, those laws, will they be based on the Bible or will they be based on creeds? That is what we have to ask ourselves. Here is a, another video clip from E511 Ministries. And let's hear what they have to say. That you vote for Sherry Clements. She is going to do everything she can to be salt and light in this arena and try to get this district on the right track. Christians have, have always been involved as salt and light influence in government in some of our most critical hours. We're supposed to be moving out here rather than backing up and saying, we should be involved with politics. We should be involved with everything. That's what salt and light is. It gets involved with everything. We must be engaged in reforming the seven mountains of the culture, not just affect what is inside the church. 2022 is the battles we're going to win in order to recover ground that was taken. And in doing so, the church is going to come to a new, dare I say, militant level of maturity. We're taking our government back. We're going to run for school board. We're going to run for PTA. We're going to run for city council. We're going to run for county board of supervisors. The public school system has become public enemy number one. We need to take back the education of our children because whoever controls the textbooks controls the future. 2022, this is a divine turnaround year. When this is overturned, which is at hand now, we are going to see the uh, really a third great awakening 
signs, wonders, and miracles, repentance, sweeping across this nation. God's raising up an awakening voice in America, and the awakening is civic as well as spiritual. I see California awakening. The wind of change is blowing. The curriculum shall be changed by my hand, says the Lord. For I am releasing my anointing that shall break the yoke of woke. The answer for America is a revival. The answer for Gen Z is a revival. They gotta have an encounter with the Lord. We need people all over the country to be willing to put on that full armor of God. We will fight. And the way that we will fight is through the inbreaking of the kingdom of God to the earth. And we will consume everything with the power of God. And we will take back this world. Nobody, not even the devil himself, can stop what God has planned for this season, for this hour, for such a time as this. This is Isaiah 60. It's time for the glorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ to arise and shine like never before. And we are going to take this nation back. We are the army of God, and we are going to take this nation back. I think I would be optimistic because the people who will become the leaders of the world, this next generation, is people like us, the ones that are That's the right answer. The ones that are here actually out there fighting the good fight. Do you feel the winds of change that are beginning to blow across this land? The Christians that I speak to, um, they all agree in theory about this Great Commission and that, yes, it has a civil application or civil implications. If we teach Jesus to obey or we teach you know, disciples to obey all of Jesus's commands in every realm of life, it's that it's going to have an effect. And especially when we cross reference that and pair it with Paul remaining in the station that you were in when the Lord called you, Mm -hmm. you know, like governors are going to get saved or the jailer, Philippian jailer is going to get saved. People in positions of government are going to get saved. And then we're going to disciple them to obey Jesus commands as they apply in that station, which means they're going to have to legislate God's law rather than man's law, all those kind of things. They want to build up the seven mountains. Now that is the theology that the church will rule again. That is the ultimate church and state union. And they will force you to adhere to their Christian laws. Question. Those Christian laws, are they based on the Bible? Or are they based on the creed? And if they are based on the creeds, will they come into conflict with those that believe the Bible rather than the creeds? The answer, according to the scripture, is yes. Let's listen to what Breitbart News has to say on the issue. Sources tell ABC News there's been a strong reaction to the raid on extremists and QAnon-related forums. Sources say there's been a strong reaction to the raid on extremists and QAnon-related forums. Sources also telling ABC News there's been a strong reaction from some extreme groups online, including QAnon and other groups. There's been a strong reaction to the raid on extremists and QAnon-related forums. Including those that were active before January 6th. Including those that were active prior to January 6th. Including those that were active prior to January 6th. Involved in the January 6th insurrection. Including those that were active prior to the January 6th riot. Some have been calling for violence and even a civil war. Some of them include calls for violence and even a civil war. Some of them include calls for violence in online forums and even civil war. This was the top comment on the search on the pro-Trump site, The Donald, last night. Quote, Lock and load with references to a civil war. Talking very violently about civil war. Searches for civil war spikes. They're talking about civil war. Civil war. Civil war. Civil war. Civil war. Civil war. war. This is the kind of violence that led to the January 6th attack. Is it possible that church and state will come together? that the Constitution will be changed? Well, remember that the Pope just met with all of those delegates in Kazakhstan. And he wrote that encyclical letter some time ago called Fratelli Tutti, on fraternity and social friendship. 
And at that meeting, he again decried these fundamentalists that we just heard about that will have to be removed from society. In 2 Corinthians 11.13, we read, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore is no great thing of his ministers also to be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Are these theologies that they base these concepts on biblical? Like Hans Hut, are they embracing premillennialism? No, they are not. Are they embracing the other issues where you stand for your particular belief though the heavens fall? For example, there is no other way to be saved than by Christ Jesus. The papacy says, no, we have to accept the creeds and live side by side in peace. No proselytizing. No preaching of these distinctive doctrines because they are based on hatred. But the Bible gives us a commission to preach. The Pope says, no, let's base everything on human fraternity. Set aside your particular biblical concepts. So basically what I'm saying is that all that is left is a social issue. You cannot preach the distinctive truths of the Bible because like Hans Hut or like Glait, or any one of them, you might just end up being condemned to death. Does the Bible say that you will not be able to buy and sell? That you will be removed from society? Does it say that you will be put to death? If you do not accept the teachings of this beast and image of the beast system, the answer is yes. Now, it's interesting that Alice A. Bailey, who was, of course, an occultist and a Luciferian, believed that the externalization of the hierarchy would commence in the year 2025. That means that demonic forces would manifest themselves in that year. She claims that humanity will move into the next phase and that this commencement will take place in 2025. It's interesting in that previous video clip, we saw that they were referring to the possibility of a civil war so that the system of Christian creed could again be united with the state. And it's interesting that a retired army general just warned that that civil war could break out as early as 2024. That means when the next election takes place in the United States of America. Now this 2025 initiative is something that is spreading throughout the entire world at a rapid pace. And the occult world is deeply ensconced in this. Now, there's an interesting point to ponder here. This occult view of this great awakening and moving into a new phase of humanity, let's call it a great reset if you want to, of just basically everything and fraternity and brotherhood at the expense of biblical truth. Will it come into conflict with Christianity? It's interesting that Jonathan Kahn recently wrote a book, The Return of the Gods, where he speculates that these gods are, of course, demonic forces and that they are returning with power to the United States. And here we see the web pages, one after the other, referring to this issue and the possibility of a great reset with the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab at its idea and time for the great reset. Now is the time Tragedy need not be the only legacy of the COVID-19 crisis. On the contrary, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine and reset our world to create a healthier, more equitable and more prosperous future. It's interesting that Khan stated that the only way to bring back the authentic is for the religious world to stand up 
and again to become a house based on Christian principles. Interesting, this is a rabbi speaking. Is the world heading in that direction? Planetary light, the great assembly of the hierarchy. The world is waiting for something spectacular to happen. The general assembly of the spiritual hierarchy, 2025. These are the web pages screaming that the time that we are living in right now is the time when we will see amazing manifestations. The Bible even says that Satan will transform himself into an angel of light. What will he say? Will he support the creeds? Will he support the doctrines of the creeds, even if they are contrary to the Bible, particularly with regard to the Sabbath Sunday issue? Here's another Web page 12. This then is the stage for the forerunner in anticipation of the major global transition up ahead in 2025. Well, let's turn to a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. As we near the close of time, there will be a greater and still greater external parade of heathen power. Heathen deities will manifest their signal power. That's exactly what Jonathan Kahn is predicting. It's like he's reading the spirit of prophecy. By a variety of images, the Lord Jesus represented to John the wicked character and seductive influence of those who have been distinguished for their persecution of God's people. All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. This terrible picture drawn by John to show how completely the powers of earth will give themselves over to evil should show those who have received the truth how dangerous it is to link up with secret societies or join themselves in any way with those who do not keep the commandments. Whatever com movement there is in this direction, whatever is associated with the creed and is contrary to the Bible, is not aligned to Jesus Christ. That's why in Revelation 22, verse 20, we read, He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. So come, Lord Jesus. I believe we are living in the final stages of this earth's history. Prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes. Exactly how it pans out, I cannot tell. But broadly speaking, there will be legislation against those that do not follow cunningly devised fables. And there will be a death decree. And there will be economic sanctions applied to them. But if we stand firm for biblical truth, God will take us through this calamity and we will come out more than conquerors through his grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the world is heading towards a precipice and thy word is supposed to be a lamp for our feet. Help us to ensure that it remains a lamp to our feet. In Jesus' name, amen.